Welcome to the Catholic Gentleman Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a man striving to live with virtue and to grow in holiness in today's world. What would you do if living your faith and becoming Catholic meant losing your loved ones? And what would you do if you were an ordained minister who had previously taught that the Catholic faith was from Satan? Today's guest experienced this exact situation in his life and has chosen Christ in his church despite the cost. He also works with companies like Mercedes, Google, IBM, American Airlines, and many more. This is a story you do not want to miss. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us on another exciting episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are so blessed that you have decided to join us. We are your hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. We are looking forward to bringing to you this episode with Jeremy Robinson. And I want to start and just kind of talk about that. How did I meet Jeremy? So I want to do a shout out to Scent Ventures. We had this uh, Scent Ventures meeting and uh, 15 or 16 guys showed up at a friend of ours house, Jeff Scheffelbein, and we were there uh, just dialoguing and telling a little bit about our stories. And um, I have these moments, right, when I'm listening to their guys. And Jeremy was one of those guys that I was like, we have to have him on our show. This has to happen. And so uh, here we are, and uh, he's going to share that story with you. But why is, is who is Jeremy or, or why did I want to bring him on? I just want to mention a few things about him before we get going. So he is the co-founder and CEO of Cardboard Spaceship. We'll get to talk about that. Uh, it's a thriving full service video production company in Dallas with decades of experience as a marketing executive and entrepreneur. He has founded several highly successful companies and he's collected a gener and generated over a hundred million million dollars in revenue. Jeremy's expertise spans the development and execution of successful commercial strategies. And I did just need to drop in a couple of the groups that he has worked with there at Cardboard Spaceship. So he has worked with Mercedes, Google, IBM, Canon, Gillette, Marriott, American Airlines, and others. I saw recently that you did something with Dave and & Buster's. And uh, I mean, these are names that... It, I imagine our listeners have have heard about, um, you know, not not Mercedes Pizza, um, you know, on the corner of uh, Story and Beltline. So, um, anyways, Jeremy, how so are you good. doing? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's delicious. That's right. How are you doing today, Jeremy? Man, I'm I'm doing great. I'm blessed. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad that you're here with us. And so, Jeremy, I want you to start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, I know you weren't born Catholic. And so we want to we want to hear as far back as you can remember and kind of, you know, that sort of uh, um, how God was working in your life to bring you to today. Oh, man, I uh, I love doing movie quotes. I wish I could have broken into the <laughs> the Goonies movie quote where where Chunk is. You know, he's, have you ever seen the movie? I have, of course. You yes, know, he's absolutely. got his hand in the blender and they're like, spill your guts, tell us everything. He's like, okay, I'll tell you everything. And in first grade, I did this and that. <laughs> I can go all the way back as, as far as you want. But mm. um, yeah, as you as you said, I was not a, uh, a Catholic growing up. And as a matter of fact, I was only recently confirmed into the Catholic church um, when I got baptized here. It's been a year and a half. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I was born um, non-denominational. No, I mean, when I was younger, we, I, I remember very vividly, we went to the uh, the Methodist church when I was young, and then we switched over to the Lutheran, and then we landed in the Assemblies of God, and I was there for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up going to uh, Christ for the Nations here in Dallas, which is a uh, non-accredited um, seminary. Um, and you know, what, what really shaped my life growing up was uh, what's called the uh, prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of that term? I have. Yeah, absolutely. It's the, it's the name it, claim it, right? Yeah. It's, you know, I've coined the term that that is the religion that, you know, makes God a vending machine, yeah. right? So these prosperity gospels, uh, preachers, these are your um, you know, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Myers, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Hagen, John Hagee, Benny Hinn. Yeah. It's if you're good enough, if you have enough faith, if you're in God's favor, God will give you all the desires of your heart. You want a million dollars? God will give you that. 
if you need healing, just reach and God will give you that healing. You know, whatever you, whatever you claim uh, without doubting, you will receive it in faith. If you have faith as mustard seed, you can move mountains. So they mm-hmm. used a lot of these, these uh, covenant scriptures in the word to state that, hey, God has destined you to be highly favored, highly successful. You know, Abraham was super rich back in his time. Moses had all of these things and all of these people that were highly favored by God. They were wealthy. And this is what God wants you to be. And so I was raised in believing that, you know, if I had enough faith or if I prayed enough or if I was good enough, you know, God would give me all the desires of my heart. Well, what happened? <laughs> we know that that doesn't necessarily <laughs> God yeah. doesn't necessarily answer your prayer simply because that's what you want, mm-hmm. right? You know, what happens when God doesn't answer you or God answers you with silence, right? Or if God answers you in a different way that wasn't what you were expected, is it because you weren't highly favored? Was it because you didn't have enough faith? Was it because you've you've got too much sin in your life? Yeah. No. So I, you know, that's what I grew up believing. I was very, very gung-ho in that for my whole life. I mean, I, I went to Christ for the nations, got done with Christ for the nations. And I had gone to a organization called YWAM youth with yeah. a mission, fantastic yeah. organization. I do not re- regret doing that. Um, I got a chance to spend years traveling the world. Um, I, you know, volunteered at AIDS clinics. I worked at homeless shelters. I built homes for the homeless. Um, I went all abroad. I mean, I went to Africa. I went um, to uh, Spain, France, all over Canada, just doing things that were that were great serving. I, I loved that. Right. But yeah, there um, there came a point where, you know, I, I ended up working for a company called uh, Ashford. And I think you're one of your friends is also a mutual friend of mine. His name is uh, Rob Hayes. He was my boss. Yeah. Mm. And during, during, it was a, like 2014 when I got, when I got hired there and I was going through, I wouldn't say necessarily a spiritual crisis at that time, but I went through a spiritual awakening in my life. I've read the scripture, first Peter three fifteen a million times, but for mm. whatever reason, I read that scripture and my, my mind kind of switched, you know, and I'm paraphrasing the word says, be ready at any moment and at any time to give a reason for the good faith that you have in our Christ Lord Jesus with compassion and with reason. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. The questions in my mind were always like, if I weren't born into a Christian family or into the United States, would I be a Christian today? Would I be a Muslim? Would I be a Hindu? If I were in some other region of the world, would I know God the way I know him now? No one can answer that question, right? Yeah. We were born and I was born into a Christian family. I was born into a Christian nation. So I really wanted to, I knew how I could explain my testimony to people based on, hey, this is what God did in my life, or this is what I, you know, this is why I love Jesus. You know, this is why I believe in Christ. Well, I wanted to be able to give a reason at any time and to anyone as to why I believe what I believe. What yeah. got me was for somebody that's looking for Christ already, that's an easy win. But if you have an agnostic that challenges you, if you have an atheist that challenges you, he's they won't use the word of God as any foundation to debate from. So if you can't use, well, John 3.16 says this, or Romans chapter whatever, insert your next Romans road <laughs> yeah. scripture into that's that. Right. If they won't listen to that, how else can you show that Christ is not only the reasonable answer, but that there's an intelligent creator behind you and behind Christ? And why does that message resonate? Why should you reasonably believe that there is something more to that story so that you can be more on my side as into why is Christ the Messiah? Why is Christ the Savior? Why did Christ die? And then, you know, let that seed of faith be able to grow. I didn't know any of that, right? I didn't know how to scientifically stand my ground through, um, you know, that reason and, you know, like how how things were created in the world and how if, you know, the axis of the, the earth was just off like a millimeter, you know, earth wouldn't exist or, you know, some of these deep philosophical, scientific, you know, reasoning. I I got really fascinated by listening to um, Dinesh D'Souza. Um, I don't know if you've listened to any 
you know, talks with Dinesh D'Souza or read any of his yeah. books, but I mean, he's an absolute amazing academic. Well, I didn't realize that that man was a hardcore born again, just on fire for God Christian, had no clue. I found out that um, <clears throat> he was hardcore believer when I listened to what's called the great God debates. So mm -hmm. here's where I entered into my spiritual crisis. So I wanted to know God, not only through what my I've experienced personally in my life, so that I can witness to other Christians. I also wanted to be able to stand the ground, have a debate, and talk to those that were seeking the existence of something higher than them, but unwilling to use the Bible as a reference point to debate from. So I'm in sales. You're in marketing. Yep. To be good at marketing, to be good at sales, you have to understand the antithesis of any argument of your product, service, company, brand, whatever it is. Who are your competitors? What are they saying about your product? What do they like? What do they not like? You've got to be able to answer that question. Well, in Christianity, uh, you know, this, you know, it, it sounds bad to say it, but you as a Christian, you're selling yourself to other people. Mm -hmm. You're selling yourself first through the actions that you that you have on a daily basis. How you act, how you treat others, how you love, how you serve, how you communicate speaks deeper to who you serve than the words that you you preach to somebody, right? So in sales as a Christian, I, I say that lightly, um, you, you have to know your word. You have to know some of these things and to be able to give that reason for somebody that's looking for that reason. So I wanted to go through that process. I wanted to understand the antithesis of the Christian argument. Well, that scared me, and it scared me for one, one reason and one reason only. There were two very, well, there was one very large uh, Christian movement giant um, that lost his faith. Have you, ever, have you ever heard of Charles Templeton, Dr. Charles Templeton? Yes. Not many people have. So, you know, I, I know you're a big reader, so it doesn't surprise me that you know who he is. Most of the listeners probably won't know who Charles Templeton is. But right. if I said, do you know who Billy Graham is? Mm -hmm. Everyone's heard of Billy Graham. Why? Because back in the, the 60s, he, he ran huge um, tent revivals, right? Yeah. And was, you know, it, it, that's the revivals in the 60s. People were giving their lives to Christ. They were, you know, calling. People were answering. And but people don't understand that Charles Templeton was actually the one that started the revivals. Billy Graham was his right hand man. So Charles Templeton and Billy Graham ran them through the 50s and the 60s. Well, Charles Templeton reached the pinnacle that I was at. And he's like, man, I, I want to know more. Like the, the whole the whole story of, you know, Christ died and this is great. We're leading people to the Lord, but I want to know it deeper. Like I really want to know it deeper. And so he said, I'm thinking about going to Oxford. I want you to join. Mm -hmm. And uh, Billy Graham said, okay, if you if we get accepted to Oxford, I'll go. And um, they applied to Oxford. They didn't get in. But they got accepted to Princeton. Mm. And so they got accepted to uh, Princeton's Theological Seminary. Billy Graham said, I'm not doing it. So Charles Templeton went and pursued his doctorate in theology. And Billy Graham continued to run the revivals. Well, Charles Templeton was forgotten. Billy Graham continued to this day and uh, continued as the revivalist. And so something sad happened. Yeah. Uh, Charles Templeton and his pursuit of deeper knowledge in theology and through Christ, he was deconverted. Why? Because when you when you look at all the academics and the research and everything else, you'll have a lot of things that will question, that will cause you doubt or to call into question what you truly believe, Right. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, flawless word of God, right? Right. <laughs> well, in theology uh, and seminaries and universities that specialize in, in religion, you'll, you'll see that there's more than 3,000 contradictions in the word of God between specific texts. So, you know, the prognosticators and academics will go, aha, that can't yeah. be an inerrant word of God because there's a flaw. You know, did the cock crow three times or did the, did the cock crow once? You know, yeah. or, you know, the book of John, you know, it's it's written, you know, estimated 75, 98 years past the, the you know, Matthew, Mark and Luke. And he wasn't an apostle on all of these things. And so that scared me. Right. Because if he lost his religion, he lost his way because he called into question doubt what he was, you know, led to believe. It's like, who am I? Well, there was another guy. His name is Dr. Bart Ehrman. He is considered yeah. today, he is New considered age. foremost 
authority on New Testament theology. He actually mm-hmm. teaches theology at uh, William or uh, University uh, William Hill or Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill, and um, he was a Lutheran minister for fifteen years. He went to Princeton and he deconverted, mm-hmm. and he now it's he's made it his his um, mission, his vocation in life to. I don't want to say deconvert as many Christians, but to cause as much doubt as possible because he believes that what he was taught was completely flawed. So, so Princeton I, is good at deconverting, um, you know, not, spiritual not, giants. <laughs> not necessarily. The thing okay. is, is there, I mean, Princeton theology is a fantastic seminary. Here's the problem: right. Right? if you go in believing without being able to understand, you know, what's happened from you know A to B, mm-hmm. you're going to go in. You're going to. It's going to shatter what you believe. For example, for example. Dr. Bart Ehrman says, you know, in the book of John, the book of John has a lot of contradictions for, you know, what Matthew, Mark, and Luke state. Specifically, you know, this is what the Catholic Church, Catholic faith really rests on. It's like, you know, Christ was being literal when he said, this is my body, this is my flesh. I mean, you right. have to do this, right? So there's a lot of things that the book of John doesn't state that, or that that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't, that, that John does. Well, John does. Here's, here's something that it got me over this hump, and, and I'll come back to this here in a second, yeah. uh, to, my, to my main point. In history, you only need very specific points of validation to make it a historical fact. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be factually correct on every aspect, but it has to be historically factual on certain events that can be collaborated, right? So in history, like my father served in the Vietnam War. He was on the USS Point Defiance. My dad can recount every mission that the U.S. Point Defiance did. He can tell you in the Da Nang and the Kwa Nang, he can tell you the evasive movers that they did. Now, my dad can write that account down in his recollection, and then you can go to the next officer who he hasn't seen in decades and ask him to do the same thing. Now, will my father's account be exactly word for word of that other officer? No. no. Will the main points of that be correct and true? Yes. Now, there's enough points in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Bible, you know, for itself, that there are a lot of things that are not necessarily word for word exactly true or, you know, recanted exactly the way it was, but there's enough historical fact to call it historical truth or historical fact. You can see that in a lot of the philosophers and historians all the way back to the date of, you know, the disciples and Jesus. You've got all these books and uh, accounts that actually will testify to things that were said in the gospel. So anyway, yeah. it's not that Princeton is bad. It's that there are a lot of things that will call into question your faith and in your your belief. And if you're not really solid in that, that can cause a lot of, a lot of doubt. So coming yeah. full circle, I wanted to understand for 1 Peter 3.15, I wanted to be a really good example. So I knew that I was going to have to go down this road to ask the really tough questions that I'm not asking myself that will be asked if I have that debate with an atheist or an agnostic. So I decided to go through uh, what's called the great God debates. Have mm-hmm. you ever heard of those? I have just because of one of my professors at Yale um, took part in it. So that's the only reason I've I've heard those. So, and I haven't watched all of them by any stretch. So they are, <clears throat> they are amazing. Well, it got me really scared. So I got on my knees and I said, Lord, listen, If Charles Templeton asked these questions and it shattered his belief enough to walk away from you, if Dr. Bart Ehrman was a minister for 15 years and he walked away from you, who am I? Like, you have to be with me because I'm about to take this rabbit trail, this rabbit hole, and I'm going down really, 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 really far. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lose you. Right. So I need you to I need you to make yourself real. So I started watching all of the great God debates. And it instantly shattered everything I ever, I ever thought, because Mm -hmm. you're listening to people like Christians and agnostics, philosophers, historians, theologians, you're listening to uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, Dr. Tim McGrew, William Lane Craig, uh, Stephen Dawkins, uh, Christopher Hitchens, Dinesh D'Souza, all of these, and they're making very valid arguments. If it weren't for the fact that you had people like Dr. William Lane Craig, Dr. Tim McGrew, Dinesh D'Souza. I would have been lost. I would have been like, man, I don't know if I believe what I believe anymore because their argument against Christ is so, so – they've perfected it, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're professionals. I mean these guys from Stanford, Yale, Harvard, all of the highest you know, schools. So um, I started really, really going through a spiritual crisis like big time. I mean to the – keep in mind my spiritual crisis lasted seven years. Yeah, seven right. Years. 
And I was researching and reading everything I could because these great God debates caused a lot of questions in my mind. And so then I started like, okay, do I really believe what I believe? So I almost like wiped the slate clean and was redefining who God was in my life. Like I need to know for myself, not because when I was a kid, my mom and dad said, this is why we believe. It's like, I need to know Jesus for myself. Like without a doubt, standing tall, tried and true, I need to know that Yes, my belief has been tested through fire, and I know that this is true because I've, I've answered all these questions. Well, the funny thing is, um, I don't think that I don't think Robert Barron, Bishop Robert Barron, was part of the God debates, but I found something watching the Great God debates. And keep in mind, I was born and raised to believe. And you may think this is funny, but I was one hundred percent born and raised to believe that the Catholic Church was a cult. The Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon. They were idolaters. They worshipped Mary. They didn't worship Christ. They prayed to the saints. And that the second coming, like the Antichrist, would be fulfilled in the current papacy. Mm -hmm. That's what I was taught as a child. So I immediately, the Catholic Church is a big no-no. Like, yeah. you're a cult. Like, you will go straight to hell because they are not Christians. That's what I was taught to believe. And here I listened to this. Robert Barron. And it sat me back so hard in my chair because the love, the beauty, the anointing that came from this man's mouth, I was like, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. You're not, you're not a Christian. You can't say what you just said. That's, that's not true. And I was so like captivated by what he said, all of a sudden that created a little seed. Yeah. Well, I started getting fearful because what, what he said spoke truth, and I felt like I was losing my way. So I immediately prayed hardcore, Lord, you have to protect me. You have to, angels, like, like go out and find men that can come into my life to like keep me accountable to this path. <laughs> God placed five men into my life, very specific men into my life. And it's crazy how they came into my life, but they, but he brought five men into my life and they were all Catholic. Mm. And it wasn't what they said. It was how they lived that spoke to who they served and drew me in. And there were two people very specifically in this group. Um, Rob Hayes, my boss, yeah. uh, just devout Christian, devout, devout, devout Christian, Catholic, hardcore Catholic. I don't think I've ever met anybody so hardcore Catholic yeah. people in my life. But he invited me to when he puts these uh, little lectures on every quarter called the Cottonwood Lecture Series. Yep. And there was a gentleman from the University of Dallas. It was the very first Cottonwood, uh, Cottonwood Lecture Series that they did. Um, it was Dr. John, Chris Wolf, Dr. Chris Wolf. And okay. his topic was, your vocation through Christ in your work. And I just, I'm looking around at like 200 people, all Catholic. I'm here as a non-denominational, you know, name it, claim it, hands raising Christian. <laughs> and I'm like listening to this guy and I'm tearing up and I'm trying not to tear up because I don't want people seeing that, that what he's saying is tried and true. But the guy's love and passion for Christ and everything was crazy. And I'm like looking around and I'm like, this can't, I'm in, I'm in, like, you guys are not Christian. Like, this is crazy. But Rob continued to help. He just ministered into my life. So I started asking questions like, okay, all right, fine, fine. Let's talk Catholic. You want to talk Catholic? Let's talk Catholic. I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. So tell me why you pray to Mary. And then he's like, okay, let's go take a walk. We were at a conference at this time. And yeah. we walked for like two hours. And what he told me, I'm like, I've never heard this. Wow. wow. <laughs> I've never heard this. Like, I've never, it never occurred to me, like in the Bible, like I was taught Mary and Joseph and all the saints, they just did the second thought, right? Christ did everything. It's Christ. You pray through him, ask for forgiveness. Christ gives that forgiveness. The whole concept of, you know, um, you know, the sacraments and forgiveness and going and get reconciliation. And all of this was foreign to me. So I'm asking Mary and I'm like, man, that makes a lot of sense. So I start researching about Mary and why, why the Catholics pray to Mary. And I'm like, God, that's really, it's really great. <laughs> it's really profound. Well, why are you, why are you praying to the, the saints? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, I guess the argument of if we're alive in Christ now, because we have Christ as our savior, 
And we're alive in Christ. That's the word says we are alive in Christ. When he is alive in us and the Holy Spirit is in us, we are alive in him. But if the saints are there in the presence of Christ, how much more alive are we with them? And the word says that the saints are interceding on our behalf. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. If they're praying and they're in presence of, of our Lord and Savior, why can't we ask them to intercede at that point for exactly. us? And I'm like, oh, my God, my, my mind started exploding. And so, um, you know, another another uh, man that came into my life, a very good friend of mine now, his name's Connor Donahue. He, uh, he and I just met for years, like every two, three weeks for breakfast. And we would have all of these topic topics and discussions. And I would read all of Dr. Scott Hahn's books. And and uh, it was it was Rome Sweet Home that actually was the nail in the coffin for me. His wow. His life was my life, you know. I was an ordained minister, you know. I've been in ministry my whole life, and then all of a sudden, you know, I was starting to question what I was believing, and then the Catholic Church came in. So, I had this enormous, terrifying moment. Yeah. Uh, this was a little about a year and a half ago. Um, Connor and I were at breakfast, and I, I said, "Yeah, you know, I'm I'm sold. I'm I'm hook, line, and sinker. I do believe the Catholic Church is the one true church." Um, I, I do believe that uh, everything that you said is correct, accurate, and true. Um, I, I found so much more joy in everything that I had been reading. My 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 spiritual life was just reignited, and I was so excited. And then he, then he, here's the try true thing. He goes, "So you you believe in it? You agree with it? Um, why don't you join the Catholic Church?" What's keeping you from joining? Yeah. What's causing you to make that? Because right now you're not part of the Catholic family. You're not part of the true church. If you believe it's the true church and the true family of Christ, why aren't you joining? And of course he called me to the table, yeah. <laughs> you know, so Crazy he called God. me to the table and I'm like, you know, it's out of fear. What are you afraid of? I said, well, if I make that decision, I'm going to lose friends. I'm going to lose family. Um, because you know, again, I'm joining the cult, right? Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm going to be Babylon. Joining, right. I'm going to be joining the whore of Babylon. I'm going to be turning everything that I believed. And, um, I, it was fear. It was fear. And so when he asked me that question, it really weighed heavy on my heart. Well, we were in, in uh, breakfast in Capel and on my way home, um, uh, I passed by, uh, the St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah. And, um, I, as I passed by it, I looked at it. And it passed by and I kind of closed my eyes and I, the, the pulling from the Holy Spirit was so hard. I went, gosh, darn it. Like, <laughs> and I pulled a U-turn and this is at 1030 in the morning, pulled the U-turn. No one's there. I pull into the parking lot and I start oh, trying to open up every door. Never been there. Don't yeah. know where to go. I'm opening it up and they're all blocked. Right. And I'm just going to every, and I finally find one that's open. Yeah. And I'm walking through, there's no one there. And I finally said, uh, I finally meet somebody. I'm like, hey, what's it take to get uh, to be a Catholic? And uh, keep in mind, I had no clue what the RCIA program was. Sure. Um, had I known what was involved in an RCI program, I'd have never done this. I just, truth to be told, I would have never have done it um, because I wasn't looking for a year long commitment, right? Yeah. Every week and weekends and um, that would have really turned me off. But you know, it's like, hey, we got the RCI program. It's actually tonight. Why don't you come and join? And he's like, hey, who's your sponsor? I was like, what's the sponsor? I said, oh, my friend Connor will do it. And, and uh, anyway, I went there and I signed up immediately. I went to my first meeting and um, I was there. And then uh, so I got I got baptized into the church. And it's been it's been the greatest experience. It took eight full years, seven years of spiritual crisis and journey um, uh, but on the eighth year, I, uh, I made the conversion to the Catholic church and I'll tell you what, this is crazy. I don't think I've been to a mass yet where I have not dropped so many tears after I've taken the Eucharist. I don't know wow. what it is, man. It's, it, it, it is a spiritual for me, gift. It's, it's, yeah. it's profound. It really is profound. So yeah. that's my journey. I know that's really long, but it's incredible. I want to take a moment and I want to thank all of our current sponsors and our donors. We are so grateful for the help that you have given us over the years. It is because of you that we have been able to expand our reach to millions of men in hundreds of uh, countries to help 
expand the vision and mission of what it means to be a man and be a saint, which is exactly what the Catholic gentleman is about. So over the next three weeks, we have a very unique request that we are going to be asking new donors to help us with. And yeah, to make a long story short, we uh, previously recorded our podcast and our God and Gentleman Plus premium content in a studio out of state for both of us. And there's various reasons for that. But we were renting equipment. We were renting studio space. And in order to use our donor money more wisely, and more efficiently, we really want to bring that studio back home to Texas. And in order to do that, though, we have to purchase some equipment to build that studio because, again, we're not renting it anymore. We need to buy our own equipment in order to record things um, in, a, in a home studio. So what we really need is your support to make that happen uh, because uh, it's, it's not it's not cheap. We have a number in mind. We need to raise $3,000, and that's the bare minimum. We've whittled it down to the bare minimum that we need to make this happen. There's no extravagances here, no fluff here. This is the equipment that we need to continue to produce high-quality content for people like you. And we want to do this because our hearts are in this. You know, we want to serve men, but we need your support and your help. Um, so that's that's the ask. Absolutely. So if you are um, open to giving us a portion of that $3,000, 5, 10, 20, 100, whatever it is that you can give, head over to catholicgentleman.com slash support. You can head over to catholicgentleman.com and you can click on the support button. It's going to take you to the same page. And over the next three weeks, for all the donation dollars that come in at catholicgentleman.com slash support, we're going to give you three free months of the Catholic Gentleman Plus, which is our exclusive membership platform that has a ton of things uh, going on with it. And so for the next three weeks, anybody that gives is going to receive three months of the Catholic Gentleman Plus as a thank you for helping us continue to expand our mission, continue to elevate the content that we are creating, and honestly save money over time so that we can continue to do this and be wise stewards of uh, the donation dollars that are coming in. Yeah, thank you again for your support as you prayerfully consider giving something to this goal, and uh, we appreciate anything that you can manage, uh, no matter how small that might be. Uh, so thank you so much for supporting high quality Catholic content. No, it, I just, I just love the, the fire and the zeal and, and, and obviously the Holy spirit is like just really, really blessing your journey as you're, you're entering into the church and just, you know, the, the thing is like converts are a blessing to the church. Like, you know, like cause Catholics, like you're familiar with it, you take it for granted. And it's like, but like, you need that fire to like see the beauty in it and like the gift and like that, that spreads right yeah. um but like i just that that deconstruction is so important it's like we all have presuppositions we all have preconceived ideas and notions about reality like it really helps us navigate the world is these these assumptions that we have these axioms that we just take for granted and it's like if if god's really going to do a work in your life and you see this in all the heroes in scripture even like that worldview has to be like just ground to dust like you know and and that's one of the hidden blessings in like the atheist movement a lot of people are like get really angry about it or like really like scared of it or whatever or like what you're talking about like these challenges to our faith and yet i think there's like there is a deepening and a purifying of the faith that happens as we have to engage and say what do i really believe and why you know are these challenges is there any truth in them like you know, who is God? What is God like? Why do I believe what I believe? Where did the Bible come from? And, and all of these questions that um, a lot of people don't want to avoid because it's too uncomfortable, yeah. you know, and a lot of parents get scared if their kids start listening to this and, and, and rightly so, because it can be disastrous to faith, as you mentioned, but, but, but also the, the there's that, that God has to like break down some of those preconceived ideas and just reduce you almost to zero sometimes for some people. I mean, some people it's, very simple, very easy. I don't know, but but for some souls, it's like God's just got to really, uh, sh you know, shatter yeah. everything so that yeah. you can build everything. You know, you can, you can build a new pattern in your yeah. life. Yeah, um, and it sounds like that's what happened for you. But yeah. but um, but how are you sharing your faith now? Like, I mean, I just hear that zeal, I hear that fire, and like that's one of the things that you know about uh, the, the, the our assemblies of God and uh, Pentecostal brothers and sisters. They're very passionate like right like about about uh and they take the holy spirit very seriously um but you're now bringing that 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 kind of yeah. uh, evangelical fire yeah. into your catholic faith and like how are you 
just using it, like using that, where's that oh. energy going? I guess. Oh yeah. Trust me. I'm, um, I'm sharing my, my story with a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of my friends, um, it's kind of the, the, like leading them to what caused me to doubt and what caused me to actually, you know, trust and, and believe in the Catholic church. One of the things that, one of the epiphanies that I had is that if you are the author of deceit, deceit, right? It, it is, when you think about deceit, what is deceit? Deceit is a little bit of truth wrapped in a lie. That's mm -hmm. deceit. Right. You can't just say this is a total lie. People are going to know that's that you don't believe that. Right. It's enough truth to yeah. make it believable, but it's misdirected. That's deceit. If you are Satan and you are the author of deceit, what is the greatest ploy? This is how I like it. This is the, the epiphany that I had in my mind. This is how I deconstructed everything. I was always believed. I was always taught to believe that the Catholic Church was bad. Look at all the scandals in the Catholic Church. Like, all you have to do is type in scandals of the Catholic Church, and it is littered with never everything. ending. Yes. Never ending, right? It is the biggest bullseye in the world. And then all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's in plain, it's in plain sight. Mm. If I were the author of deceit, how would I create the greatest deception from truth if this is the true church? I'd create massive scandal. Anytime you involve human element to the spiritual nature, you will always have just crazy stuff happening. I mean, there's there's no amount of scandal. There's there's look up any church. I don't care what it is, whether whether it's a Christian church or anything else, there's scandal across them all. Like the Assemblies of God or the Methodists, the Lutherans, right? You all have the the sexual scandals, the financial fraud, the 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 crime, everything, right? Anytime you introduce human element to the spiritual nature, you are going to have a cluster. And yes. it's bad. Why? Because we're human. We are flawed. We are, we are all sinners. in need of a savior. Yep. That's right. But the thing about the Catholic Church is if if I don't want people coming to the Catholic Church, what am I going to do? I'm going to paint a big old red bullseye on it and I'm going to create it as the mother of all scandals. And I'm like, what? Like, I mean, even reading back through the Protestant Reformation, you know, the, the 99 thesis for Martin Luther was never intended to create the Protestant Reformation. But a lot of people don't understand it. If they haven't studied it, the, 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 thesis, the theses that, you know, took place back in those days, they would, they would post some ideas that they wanted to debate from, right? So they would, they would post debates and then they would come into the village square and then they would start debating about specific topics. And Martin Luther had some very, very keen topics about, you know, what what he wanted to say about you know priests being compensated for you know the prayers to release those in purgatory and all of these things well that just you know ended up creating the protestant reformation well from the protestant reformation you have all these different religions that ended up breaking off and now i i've heard that the i've heard there's like 10,000 denominations of christianity a lot of different numbers that come out there yeah 30,000 35,000 yeah there's yeah, there's, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know but you know what's really interesting is that you look at the assembly of God or the Methodist or the Lutheran or, you know, whatever the church of Christ and the position of their beliefs have always changed over the centuries. They have changed. The Catholic church has never changed. Yeah. Never, never. It's always maintained its position in utter absolute solidarity and position. And that, that really spoke, spoke something to me. So that was kind of a point. So, Whenever I'm I'm talking to my friends, I'm 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 literally I'm talking about the legitimacy of the church and the the truth. Like when when Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and no principality or kingdom shall rise against it. And paraphrasing, right? When he gave him the keys of the kingdom, he gave him the power of the church. And you can take everything from that very moment all the way to today, and you can trace it back. Everything, everything the yeah. church does, it's routed grounded and surrounding all of that tradition it has meaning how many people know that you know every catholic church that's built was built surrounding a specific theme specific mm -hmm. meaning did you know that yeah. i didn't know that i mean i looked at them all they're all gaudy and everything else and it realized like there's specific meaning behind that church to give glory to god Amen. like from the moment you touch the handle of that door and you open it up everything that you do everything that you hear everything that you see prepares you 
to take communion, to receive the Eucharist, to have the miracle of faith united together with the saints and with the communion of angels where heaven and earth are joined together. I'm saying Scott Hahn, yeah. right? It's an orchestra. It's a spiritual orchestra, and it's absolutely amazing. And when, you know, to your point, Sammy, you were saying that, you know, cradle Catholics, they take advantage or they take for granted what they've grown up to believe, right? It's it's once you, it's almost like when when my wife and I go skiing in Colorado, we're like, why do we live in Texas? It's so beautiful here. And yeah. we talk to the people that are in Telluride or wherever we go, you know, skiing, they're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's beautiful how I've lived here for 20 years. And it's almost like they take for granted what they have. It's like the, yeah. the mountains lose their luster. And for us, I'm just like, oh, my God, look at these mountains. They're so amazing. And, like, that's the way I kind of feel like I am right now with the Catholic Church. It's like, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, that's what, that's why the stained glass windows. That's why you have all these stations of the cross. That's why you have the, the altar up front. That's the meaning of the candle. That's the meaning from all of this. And then uh, it's all together to accentuate all the worship that you're about to receive together. It's like, do people, do a lot of people understand the process of the, the priests getting dressed before they give? their homily, or before they serve the Eucharist, the armor of God, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, loins of girded about truth, feet shot of preparation, gospel, peace, sword, spirit, and the shield of faith. As they say that, as they're putting on their, their garments, it's the priestly robes. I mean, it's just, dude, I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah. It's crazy. Like when you realize that this, it's just more than just standing and kneeling and listening to the, you know, the songs and praying and then receiving your, you know, the, the bread and the wine and taking your Eucharist and people going down. And, you know, it, it's, I was raised to believe that that is just rudimentary. You're just doing things just to do them. Yeah. And yeah. It's a form of idolatry or yeah. yeah and I, and I think so not right. No, you hit the nail on the head though, that the sacrament of the Eucharist is when heaven touches the earth and that happens every single week. And I mean, we argue this on the show, but if you realize that your whole demeanor, your whole person, your whole outward appearance, everything changes to try and be, you know, fully present to heaven touching the earth. And, and we had an architect on our show, one of the earliest episodes that we ever did. And I remember him talking about the fact that uh, in by intention, they made churches very echoey so that when somebody walked in with their heels, they wanted them to slow down because they could start hearing their clicking going everywhere. And it was like, everything is by intent, right? Like we don't disrupt the beauty of, of you know, what's happening. And I think that's great. And so I, I, I want to talk um, about your, your journey further in your, in your work life. But before we get there, no man is an Island. And I think that this is really important because this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show is because you stated I'm on a mission to bring everybody to the Catholic faith. And I remember you saying something along those lines <laughs> at the event. And I was like, me too. Like we're on this mission together. This is phenomenal. And I was like, but, but, in saying this, that you went through a, a seven year, eight year um, uh, conversion or, or wrestling with your faith and coming into uh, the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith, um, thanks be to God, uh, you did so with that concern of losing uh, friends and family members and things like that. And I'd love for you to talk just a little bit about that complexity as it unfolded throughout this journey, because I think it's important for our listeners to understand, because you you went through it in eight years and 20 minutes, which we're grateful for. But, you know, there's a there's a lot of depth to uh, that relational aspect that that we are called to and that we have experienced in life. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, how your family received that. I know you're a father. I know you're a husband. And um, and just share a little bit about that with us. So. Yeah, two. Two aspects, my my direct family, like. um so I, I had made mention directly to my family during this whole thing that I was leaning towards, you know, the Catholic Church being tried and true, the Catholic Church being right, and that direction, like, going there. And it was almost like a nuclear bomb went off, like, oh, my God, oh my God you're backslidden, you're just, you're, I can't, you know, Satan is, you know, whatever. Yes. Um, so, you know, I knew that, you know, had I made that that decision, it would be a uh, a monumental um, issue. You know, truth be told, um, I, I haven't fully 
uh, told my parents that I was confirmed and baptized into the Catholic Church. Yeah. My mom and dad are older. My dad's 80. My mom's in her late 70s. And health problems are down. And mm. I, you know, part of me is like, do I want to cause, you know, my dad to have a stroke or a heart attack? Do I want, you know, no, I don't. Um, but I won't shy not, away yeah. from it. If if it's asked, I, you know, won't shy away from it. Um, same thing with my, my older brother. Um, he's a pastor. I, I have told him, I have debated these things with him. And, you know, if I, if I told him that I was confirmed into the Catholic church, I, I just really feel like he would just go like, mm. so just um, a moment I, uh, listeners here, let's, let's offer up a prayer for this. Let's offer up a prayer for healing and reconciliation and, and, and openness. So um, I appreciate you sharing that. I didn't want to I apologize about interrupting, no. but I just felt called to, you know, no, there are a lot totally of people going to be listening to this and, and what a great opportunity to, to unify in prayer here. So, yeah. So my, uh, you know, my, my sister, she knows, and, um, I've had the opportunity with her family to just, just share my experience, not, not preaching. Cause you know, we uh, obviously grew up in the same family, very spiritual and, you know, grew up in the same name it, claim it gospel. And, you know, just where God is viewed as your vending machine, like serving you rather than viewing, you know, God as God, man, he's our father. He's our man. That's a different, different talk, different coffee talk. Instead of viewing God the way he really is, not what, what he can do for us if we have enough faith or because we're good enough or because we have favor. If I'm good enough, I'm going to be successful in business. No. Like if things happen in your life and things are bad, well, why don't why don't you ask God, show me like like if this is your will, like if if this is like I've 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 befriended several priests and nuns. Mm -hmm. Um Connor, Connor Donahue's sister-in-law is a nun and she is my pen pal, like legit, like pen, everything. And she'll, she'll go through like things and she's, she's taken the vocation and the, um, the, uh, when you take a vow, a vow of, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, chastity, thank you, yeah. poverty, chastity, right. So she has nothing to her name, nothing. And something bad will happen. Like, like either, um, uh, she got COVID or she told me a story when she got like robbed. And the first words out of her mouth was, thank you, Lord. What a Thanks gift. Mm. Like what, what a gift. What, wait, what? What a <laughs> gift. Like when, when bad things happen, we're so quick to say, why are you doing this God? Like what uh, pointing the fingers back or I'm not good enough, or I didn't have enough faith instead of saying, God, show me who you are through this, use this to make me better anyway. So I use this experience to be able to really kind of witness to my, my, uh, my sister and, and uh, her family. And, um, they're, I, I really believe they're very ripe to, um, to, uh, convert. Um, yeah. that it, it's been resonating with them. My best friends, um, I have sat there for hours and now it's been, you know, several years going through and we'll debate, like we'll pull up these debates and, um, they're like, yeah, well, I'll, I'll go to mass with you, but I'm mm -hmm. very interested in understanding this a little bit more. I've not heard it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. I'd like to feel what you feel. So, um, it's, it's more telling the story of, listen, I, I've, I've been a Christian my whole life. I've been in ministry for the vast majority of my life as an ordained minister. I went to seminary. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I didn't make this decision lightly. It took yeah. me eight years to say, okay, now I'm doing this and this I'm a hundred percent, 100% in agreement. And I do not regret the decision that I've made. That's how confident I am. Let me just tell you why I made that decision. And if that resonates with you, let's talk. If it resonates with you, why don't you come to mass with me? Why don't you experience the, 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 the holiness, the, the silence, the, just, I, I can't, I can't put it into words. It's just, I go to like a regular church service now and I don't want to say I'm annoyed, but I just look around and it's like, I feel like I'm at a concert, right. Which is fine. Um, yeah, but yeah. I guess maybe just in my, my, my older age, it's just this, it means a lot more now that I know the, the whole, every detail of like the, why, why do you do what you do? What, what is it supposed to mean? And then you reflect on that and you realize what it is. You just, for me, it's a, whoa, it's a, wow. It's a, yeah. every time I do it, it's just, it's, it's crazy. So that's, that's the first, my, my, my parents, um, I haven't had the, uh, the ability to just tell them yet, kind of 
waiting for that right time. I have started to tiptoe with some of the other family, uh, my direct family. Um, my wife is always uh, very supportive. She's, you know, the greatest thing in my life. I've got the greatest Praise family, I've got the greatest marriage. Um, everything that we do, she's my my best friend. I love my kids. It's like I just I absolutely love doing that. So, you know, we had gone to um, a church here in Frisco, non denominational. So, going from a non denominational church to a Catholic church is a stark contrast. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, they're they're totally different. So, it's it's been an adjustment. It's been a little difficult uh, to you know really kind of explain why, but my uh, my kids are 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 going and they 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 actually enjoy it. My my daughter has actually started asking a lot of questions, and it also helps that uh, two two people just right down the road from uh, from me are they go to Saint Francis. And uh, their kids go. And so they see their kids doing it and they see their kids going through their confirmation. And, yeah. and my daughter was like, daddy, I'd like to, I'd like to get baptized. Wow. So it's, uh, it's slowly, but surely, you know, yeah, you're going. Okay. So it's a oh, journey. I appreciate that. Yeah, man, it is. Yeah. And it's still going. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the relationships are the hardest part, you know, being calmer myself, like re- the, there's a lot of, potential suffering there. I mean, one of the things that helped me in my conversion was Cardinal Newman, one of a famous convert from 1800s, you know, um, wrote a little story about like a young man, like converting the Catholic faith, which, you know, in England at the time was like extreme, extreme, extremely, you're a pariah. I mean, you were completely rejected. You were completely socially ostracized converting from the church of England to Catholicism at that time. And, he had to like go home and tell his mom and like, it was just a lot of pain there. And like that story really helped me, but, but like, it was always been that way, right? Like the martyrs of the early church, like sometimes they were going against their own family. Sometimes their own family was the one turning them in to the Roman yeah. authorities and things like yeah. that. And it's like, you, just, you have to follow that call of conscience. And the thing is, uh, the, I love what you said about suffering. Like, you know, like the, in the prosperity gospel circles, right? Like, it's like a failure. If you're suffering, like you don't have enough faith. Like there's like, but suffering lot, is part of life. Of like, yeah. Yeah. And that's like part of the thing, the beauty of our Catholic faith is like suffering, two things. Like number one, suffering can be a means of grace. It can be a means of purification. It can be a means of illumination. It can be a means of union with God almost. It's not meaningless. But second, like suffering can be transformed into something beautiful, something good, uh, which is ultimately the message of the cross, right? Like the greatest evil, the yeah. greatest suffering becomes the greatest good. Um, and I, I love that you highlighted that because that is one of the most powerful witnesses of Catholicism is yeah. like the suffering. We're, yeah. We're, and when you when you're suffering, you you feel like you're like under attack or you're out of God's grace or God's favor, right? What are you doing? Well, I I, I went through that, that that line of questioning in my mind and I, I got this book. It's the discernment of spirits. Have you ever read this? I have not. It's I haven't, but Tim- I haven't read it. <laughs> it's by Timothy Gallagher. Yeah, uh, he's awesome. And, yeah, he's a great writer. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, man. So for the listeners, if you haven't read that and you ever find yourself you know, a point of suffering and you're like, why God, why just pick, pick this up. It's oh, uh, it's a great read. Um, it helped me answer a lot of those questions. So yeah, you know, one of the things that some of these men that are in my life are, are telling me is that, you know, th- this may be your vocation, you know, some of the suffering that you're experiencing with, um, with this conversion, mm-hmm. it, it may be the grace that God's pouring out into your life so that you can, you help those that are in similar yeah. situations you know, get through that tough decision. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. And so we are coming up near the end here. We're going to have to have you on again uh, to talk further, but share with us a little bit about your your business. I, I want to hear a little bit about Cardboard Spaceship and why you yeah. chose that name and and maybe one of your favorite uh, uh, commercials or products uh, projects that you've been able to work on and, and where men can go to listen to that, all those great awesome. things. Awesome. Yeah. Cardboard Spaceship, we're a full service video production company. Um, we work with um, a lot of agencies around the globe. So um, if you're in the marketing world, if you've heard of WPP, Gray, 
160 over 90, Mother, Barkley, uh, Weber, Shandwick, Edelman, Edelman, Smithfield. These are agencies that are what's called the agency of record for brands. Brands yes. like Shady's, Google, Apple, uh, American Airlines, no, you know, uh, any brand that you see. Yeah, they they have those agencies that will um, that will help you or help them create commercials or corporate videos or whatever. And that's that's what our company does. We have three locations. We've got an office in Dallas, one in New York, one in Chicago, and we serve these agencies by creating commercials for clients. I love my job, um, even though video production is very much the same, right? I mean, you're you've got your cameras, you've got your lighting, you've got all of the process kind of the same. But the thing that I love about the industry is that it's just it's different every single time because you're dealing yeah. with a different client, a different brand, and you deal with the directors that we have, that we represent, they create these awesome treatments, these storylines, and you're coming up with all these amazing concepts and then you get to see it happen. And then you do the post-production and then you see the commercial and you're like, oh my God, this is so yeah. great, right? So I love what I do. I love helping brands find their voice through creating videos. Um, we have two verticals at the company. We do commercials, which are what uh, the industry, the marketing industry say. Th that's the sexy campaigns that you want to work on. That's yeah. what everybody tries to get on. Everybody wants to do a, you know, a Dave and Buster's commercial or an LL Bean commercial, right? But that's that's the one vertical that we do. The other vertical is we do uh, financial communications video work. So publicly traded companies, they've got investor days, they've got analyst days, or they've got corporate videos that they need to to shoot, you know, um, anything, anything that they need done visually for their brand, we do as well. So those are the two verticals that we primarily focus on. And uh, yeah, love, love what we do. I would say my, my favorite prod, my favorite commercial that we've done here recently, it's kind of between two. I love okay. the Dave Busters and main event yeah. uh, work that we did here recently. That that team is amazing. I mean, they're they're utterly amazing, and I love the brand. It's I I think selfishly because I spend entirely way too much money <laughs> <laughs> at Dave and Busters and main event with my kids. It's one of our favorite places to go. So I yeah. really loved getting behind those video productions for main event and uh, Dave and Busters. But we just finished up a, a very large commercial shoot for LL Bean. Okay. And that was just, that was fantastic because we, we used um, different, different production style technologies to create some commercials and the commercials will be uh, launched here uh, actually in the next month. Oh, so terrific. they'll be all over the United States. So really, really, really enjoyed doing that. So. I got to ask, how did you go from all these years in ministry and you know that world to marketing and and really um, killing it there. I mean, it sounds like you're yeah. doing fantastic. Yeah. So that that's that's maybe for an, another call. But you yeah. know, but quickly, <laughs> totally, you know, I, I I worked at Ashford. Um, I had been in the commercial real estate industry for a number of years. Sold the company, and then I went and uh, worked with Ashford. Ashford is a uh, publicly traded asset manager in the hospitality space. And I was in the uh, investor relations uh, PR division of the company. So handled a lot of the messaging and, and, and worked with a lot of the institutional investors, shareholders, et cetera. So um, long story short on that, we decided, you know, back in like 2015, started to do some internal video work and they had looked for outside vendors, found out that it's very expensive. So I started doing it internally, said, I can do this. I had never done it in my life. And yeah. I'm like, I have to do this, right? How hard can it be? So uh, ended up, you know, and that's a very generalized, very like simplistic explanation. But um, I started working with a, a buddy of mine that I had gone to church with. His name is Matt Engelking, who's a current partner at Cardboard Spaceship. He and I worked together and doing freelance work on the side. And I just found out that I just really, really loved it. And so we kept doing this work for Ashford and all of a sudden it started turning into referrals. We had no website. We weren't doing this. We both had full-time jobs. Jobs, yeah. And we kept getting referrals and referrals and referrals and referrals. And he goes, hey, man, have you ever thought about doing this full-time? I'm like, absolutely not. I love my job. Ashford was fantastic. Nobody could have been a better boss than, than Rob Hayes. Yeah. My, my, it was just fantastic. And then COVID happened. Mm. <laughs> COVID happened and the hospitality industry imploded. And mm. so Ashford literally, uh, you know, was forced to let go of like, it, just the almost the whole company it was bad um but you know it had to had to happen because people stopped traveling so i was left with well what am i going to do now 
And um, I told Matt, I said, hey, man, what do you think about, you know, that idea? He's like, let's do it. So I jumped in with both feet shortly after 2020, took some time off, kind of, you know, honed in that uh, that business decision. And we started uh, continuing on those referrals. And Sam, it was, uh, we got a huge breakthrough. We, we had a, a company, small company called Gray Advertising. <laughs> there you go. One of the executive producers reached out and said, hey, I saw some work that you did. We're going to wow. be doing a commercial down there in the Dallas area. We'd like you guys to throw your name in the hat. We threw our name in the hat and we actually won it. Mm. And then that just compounded, snowballed. The executive producer was, uh, his name was Michael Sapienza at the time. And all of a sudden we started getting more. We started getting uh, work for uh, Walgreens. Then we did an IBM commercial. And then all of a sudden it just kept compounding and compounding and compounding. And we went from zero to like to the moon, like overnight. Wow. And uh, Michael Sapienza actually joined the company as our head of production. And so- Oh, thanks be to God. Yeah, we ended up growing so fast. We got uh, private equity investors back to the company. And uh, so we we just grew and- that's uh it's it's That's it's a, a short thing. yeah yeah it's a good thing i wouldn't have ever guessed in a million years i would have done this but wow. I'm, I'm having fun it's the it's a blast Wow. Well, praise God, Jeremy. And I'm just so grateful that you would uh, spend some time and your and your busy schedule and day and everything to share your story with us and to uh, be a part of the Catholic gentleman uh, through this podcast here. So you yeah, are in our that prayers. You even asked me to do it. Yeah, well, I'm grateful. I'm, and we will. We'll have to have you on again and uh, maybe in person, you know, one of these times, uh, uh, not too long. So anyways, again, thank you so very much for for being with us today. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And as we end each of our episodes. Be a man, be a saint. <laughs>